Uh, well, thanks for sticking with us, guys. Uh, for our final discussion today, we're going to be discussing all things medical device security with uh, Richard Stainings, Chief Security Strategist for Silera. Welcome. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, well, I think that you and I both uh, typically sent, uh, tend to start these conversations on a high level, but just to make sure that everyone's on the same page, let's sort of Let's begin with the driving causes uh, behind healthcare's poor cyber uh, medical device security posture and how that can readily impact patient safety uh, and enterprise cyber risk. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the medical device problem is one that's existed for a long time. Um, the big issue that we have is that medical devices were never designed with security in mind, right? They were designed for medical clinical function in mind uh, to perform a single task usually uh, and to perform that thousands uh, or tens of thousands of times during the lifetime of that particular device and to do it very, very well, right? It's kind of similar to the mechanical processes involved in opening and closing an elevator door, for example. Uh, you want to make sure the elevator opens quickly and closes quickly and that the elevator stops at the floor rather than in between floors, right? Right? That's kind of the parameters of functionality of a medical device. So when you start to layer on security on top of that or concerns about security on top of that, you get into kind of new territory, certainly when you consider that many of the medical devices that we have in our hospital systems today are you know, sometimes 20, 20 years old, right? Uh, there is a five to six year FDA approval process for any medical device. Uh, and that uh, is basically uh, a, a period of time that is used from the inception of the design of that device through to its approval uh, for use uh, on patients in hospitals. Um, so that, that five to six year window basically means that anything that's brand new is using technology that's five to six years old already. Right? And in IT, five to six years is a very, very long time. When we layer on top of that the lifetime of these devices, the expected use of these devices, that's another potentially eight to 20 years, normally eight to 15 years uh, of usage on top of that, which gives us then a period of essentially 21 years for your average medical device uh, in use in hospital. Now, 21 years ago, most of us were running Windows 2000, right? If we were lucky, or maybe we we're still on something even older at that particular point. I think none of us in this audience today would be um, surprised to know that Windows 2000 is inherently vulnerable um, today and none of us would go out and buy uh, a PC or want, even want to operate a PC uh, that was running Windows 2000. That's not to say it wasn't a great operating system in its time, if there's any Microsoft uh, you know, fans or employees in the, uh, in the audience, but it's dated, right? There are ver vulnerabilities as a result of that technology. And I think this is where we are today in that um, we've got legacy systems um, in our hospitals that have uh, security vulnerabilities and deficiencies in the design of their, in their cybersecurity controls and protections uh, that are now beginning to catch up with us. And this is compounded by the growth in medical devices uh, across the industry. Uh, medical devices are growing at about approximately 25% compound per annum globally. Um, and they now account for three quarters of unmanaged devices or three quarters of devices that are connected to, to hospitals. So you can see the magnitude of this problem and also the, uh, the growing risks that are, are, are associated by, uh, by this particular uh, concern. When we talk about vulnerabilities, uh, we discussed earlier uh, this morning, um, you know, uh, the average, uh, the, the five to six uh, year old vulnerabilities that are sort of prevalent and we add these onto it, we're creating this long ongoing challenge that doesn't seem to have a solution. But there are vulnerability reports um, from vendors that sort of push products rather than, you know, uh, risk management strategies. I, it, I feel often that we have a hard time deciphering between what is the most important thing to fix, but also, um, you know, does this affect patient care? Um, you know, first, how can we sort of av avoid falling into that sort of media breach reporting trend of um, becoming white noise with vulnerability reports and sort of vulnerability disclosures? But then secondly, what, what should we do with these reports that we're seeing and how do we prioritize? So I think there's two problems there. One is the, the magnitude of the problem, which I've already alluded to. Mm. Um, securing medical devices is no easy task. 
um, and we can get into some of the details of that in a bit if you like. Um, but there's also a lot of fear, uncertainty and doubt that is being spread by vendors to say the sky is falling, um, you need to fix this particular problem um, and you need to do it with our, our solution. Uh, but I think first of all we really need to understand and quantify what the risks are um, around medical devices and there are essentially two ways that vendors are, are operating in this particular space. One is by use of static lists of, of known vulnerabilities, MDIS2 reports, for example, um, or other reports that vendors have discovered as a result of their work at other hospital systems. Um, and then there's more of a real-time uh, approach to understanding and analyzing what the, the risks are on any network. And one of the things that, that we've done at Silera um, through the use of our digital twin technology is to do uh, real-time um, risk, full risk assessment of devices to NIST 800-30R2 standards, for example, uh, versus a rudimentary threat report, which some of the earlier, earlier vendors in the space uh, came up with. Um, and what we do is we take a, a very detailed profile of a device, push that up into a virtual machine where we can do destructive pen testing mm -hmm. against that virtual machine, safe in the knowledge that it's not going to cause any damage to a patient because it's not attached to a patient, and safe in the damage that we're not going to destroy a, a device, a fryer device, for example. Mm -hmm. And that gives us real-time intelligence um, of devices that we can then use to to prioritize risk remediation for, for hospitals. Sure. Um, you cannot, uh, it's almost impossible to resolve all of the vulnerabilities and all of the risks uh, that are present across your entire medical device ecosystem. But what you can do is you can prioritize those that are the most uh, concerning, the greatest impact or the greatest probability, um, and put in place uh, compensating security controls like micro segmentation, for example, or many other other forms of compensating cons uh, security controls while you work with vendors to get patches made available. Well, there's obviously, uh, you know, importance in vulnerability disclosures, and I think that, I think the concern is, for me at least, that it seems that everything seems to be a risk, right? Um, and we can't secure everything, we know this, but how do we know, um, for example, um, infusion pumps, that is a common disclosure where we know that at least 75% are typically vulnerable, but how common is that as an attack vector? Is it a pivot point or, you know, are there easy sort of ways to sort of reduce that? I, I'm just curious. Yeah, um, network connected infusion pumps are, are a favorite, you know? Uh, for the, the FUD specialists um, because of the, the, the visualization and the simplicity of the device, right? right. They, are, they are inherently simple devices. They push drugs to a patient, whether it's you know, morphine to a patient in the emergency room who's just suffered a road traffic accident or someone with you know, uh, some other condition that maybe need, uh, needs insulin uh, you know, uh, applied to them or some other drug dripped into them. And that drip is controlled by what's called the drug library, right? And drug libraries can be programmed. Mm -hmm. Normally they're programmed by physicians or BMETs um, that will say so much morphine over so many hours. What you don't want is the drug library to be compromised by a hacker, for example, so that uh, the entire vial of morphine is dispensed to a patient in 20 minutes rather than over the course of 20 hours. Yeah. That would put the patient into, uh, into uh, you know, cardiac arrest, essentially, or, or, or bring them around uh, an early death, shall we say, as a result of that. Now, Hacking a, an infusion pump is something that has been known and has been proven since uh, 2007. Um, a New Zealand uh, white hat hacker by the name of Barnaby Jack demonstrated this live on stage um, and um, successfully uh, showed what could happen um, when, uh, when uh, a, a dummy um, attached to, a, uh, to a, uh, an infusion device um, is hacked, right? And essentially, drugs were administered to that dummy on stage uh, that would have killed that dummy. He was also able to demonstrate uh, how to hack a pacemaker, for example, by use of RF antennas, right? Nothing as sophisticated as we, we have today. And many, uh, many security practitioners have, have been able to demonstrate this at RSA and Black Cat and um, a heap of other conferences ever since. So th the risks are known about it. Um, um, and it's, it's a fairly easy to understand linear concern because a, a, an infusion pump is connected on one side to the patient directly and on the other side to the network. And therefore there's that 
that human technology bridge that's very visual, very apparent there. But there are other medical devices that are equally um, as, uh, or potentially de deadly, right? If we look at radiological treatment systems, um, I'm not gonna mention the name, but there was a, a radiological uh, treatment system back in the 80s, uh, which had bad programming. Um, they changed mechanical mechanisms to, um, software-based mechanisms to control the flow of radiation to, uh, to cancer patients receiving treatment. And the software broke down because they didn't have sufficient security controls, sufficient due diligence um, in the um, manufacture of that software. And most of the vendors had, had actually retired and moved on by the time they realized there was a problem. The result was a whole heap of patients got fried, right? They received over 100 times more uh, radiation than doctors have prescribed and they were literally cooked. Um, and there's at least five deaths that, that we know of uh, that resulted from that. So that's a, a cancer treatment system. Now you can take that same principle and you can apply it to everyday x-ray machines, CT scanners, MRI systems, PET scanners, right? All of the other medical equipment that is used to diagnose patients. Then you can apply it to a, the whole sphere of medical devices that we have connected wired or wirelessly in our hospital systems. And you can say, well, the magnitude of this problem is, is huge, right? Um, where do we start? And that comes back to my earlier point about prioritization and understanding, understanding risks. Well, that's sort of, I, I did realize that while we're here, I, I feel like some people don't understand what the real challenge is in securing medical devices. Uh, I know Chime for years has sort of discussed that there's inventory issues where there's no real time data on patch management. It's not possible to apply some of these things, I think that it would benefit uh, those that maybe aren't as obsessed with this as we are, that uh, we can sort of discuss those challenges and sort of how we begin to chip away at it. Yeah, so I mean, there's, there's a, a structural reporting problem here um, that goes back a long time and it's beginning to change, right? Because we're getting, um, we're getting different lines of reporting in, in hospital systems today. But essentially, medical devices were managed by one team. Um, that team reported through you know, clinical engineering typically or biomed or depending on the hospital structure, sometimes even facilities, right? Uh, and that was outside the IT reporting line, yeah. right? Security traditionally has been part of the IT, secure, uh, the IT reporting line and therefore security didn't have visibility into what was happening around medical devices. So that's the first part, the, the visibility part. The second part is really on the vendor uh, provider partnership around securing uh, those medical devices. And this is something that the FDA has stipulated. It is, it is a partnership. It's not wholly reliant upon uh, hospitals or clinics to manage the security of those devices. And it's not wholly the responsibility of vendors in order to produce devices that are more secure um, or secure and are maintained at a secure level um, throughout their, uh, their lifespans. And there's a number of issues that we haven't really addressed from a legal regulatory perspective, mm -hmm. despite FDA pre and post market guidance over the last few years. And I know you and I have talked about, you know, some new legislation uh, in, in that particular space. There's, yeah. there's certainly some emphasis around what do we need to do? Most of the regulation today is, is advisory, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, Margie Zook and I have presented, um, and Kathy uh, Petrozino and I have, have presented on this problem of you know how do we how do we take that advice and how do we make sure that that advice is permeated to everyone who needs to know in a hospital so that they can make remediation uh, acceptable. So there are really two sides of this. One is the fact that vendors need to understand the risks in their devices. They need to be looking for risks in their devices and they need to be making patches available quickly to providers so that, uh, pat so that devices can be patched and security remediation can be addressed. And then secondly, uh, providers need to ensure that they are aware of risks. Uh, they are aware of what assets connect to their network they can understand the magnitude of, of the risks of each of those device types that attach to their network, and therefore they can prioritize the patching of devices given the fact that you would need an army of uh, a thousand people you know, running around patching you know, devices if you were to try and tackle it you know, uh, all, all at once. So this is not an easy problem to solve. 
Um, but I think putting in place the right technologies so that you've got good asset inventory rather than a manual spreadsheet, which is inherently out of date, <clears throat> um, and you have good risk assessment technologies to understand what are the true risks of a device versus you know what's just being reported by the vendors through MDS uh, MDS2 records or or something else, right? <clears throat> and then you know how do we go about uh, putting in place compensating security controls for the worst of them? That's true, and I think that. I've seen, so I, I think Miter and I were discussing sort of how bio, there seems to be breaking down the barrier between biomed and IT, so we're getting more. We are. We which are. is fantastic, but are there other ways to improve that inventory challenges? I've seen estimates where, you know, uh, a hospital will say they have, you know, I have a thousand devices, but in reality, you know, it's like 10 or more, yep. you know. I've seen that on a number of, uh, number of assessments that I've done over the years yeah. where the device count is off by an order of magnitude, mm. right? Um, just as you say there. Um, I think it comes down to the way that devices are periodically connected to the network. Mm. Um, they're switched on when they're needed. When they're not needed, they go back into a closet, right? Yeah. Devices are reallocated to different wards of hospitals, yeah. different departments. Uh, they go home with patients that are post-operative, yeah. right? And then they come back three months later when the patient finally brings them back to the hospital or the hospital sends them a bill for a you know, $50,000 infusion pump or whatever they, they took home with them, right? Uh, and they decide that they don't really need to keep that one. They can happily give that back to the hospital now, right? Um, so yeah, th this is this is where we are. But that collaboration needs to improve. It needs to be better. Yeah. And I think there's probably some role for uh, some better oversight and better regulations and better emphasis and better definition of what it takes to secure a medical device at the vendor yeah. level. Yeah, I, I, from, um, you know, what, from a policy perspective, obviously, I feel like, because that seems to be what needs to happen, right? This is a tremendous challenge. We're struggling with other processes and this is tacking on top of it. You know, it's a magnitude, right? So what lever, levers should the government be leveraging to sort of better secure it from a manufacturer perspective? Um, you know, like a cyber baseline, like you and I discussed, they, um, uh, presented at the Aspen right. Institute. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, so I, I think that the government needs to come out with clear definitions of, of what is that cyber baseline, right? And they need to provide that to manufacturers so that manufacturers know. There's a lot of ambiguity um, in the current regulations, just like there is in HIPAA, right? Anything right. that comes out of the government is fairly ambiguous. Um, unfortunately, and there, there's also a parallel conversation around a revamp to HIPAA if you've been following what's going on in the house at the moment. Uh, whether it comes about or not is, is another question. Um, but uh, yeah, establishing a baseline um, is really going to be a, a critical next step, I think. Mm. So. I mean, it, it seems like that is what's necessary, because if we consider that, you know, I remember the, over the summer there was a discussion about um, how a manufacturer can even go into the device wall without telling you, uh, or you can't go into it or without breaking the license, you know. Those seem like regulatory issues that should be at the very beginning of all of this, because if we can't patch because our vendor says no, I mean. So the, the way that the system works at the moment is the vendor some vendors create patches mm. and make those patches available to hospitals to apply, right? Or to the management companies like G Medical or whoever's managing the medical devices on behalf of that vendor. Some of the big vendors obviously manage their own devices at hospitals like Philips and, and, uh, and, and what have you, right? Mm. Um, but uh, the uh, other vendors at uh, the other extreme uh, are less effective, less efficient at uh, bothering with security, right? Some are wantonly negligent. And those of you who remember reading up about the Muddy Waters case several years ago, mm. well, and the St. Jude Medical uh, pacemaker, which resulted in an FDA recall. Uh, you can Google it. I wrote an article um, at the time on the, on the subject. But um, we'll know that this was a, a, a bit of a game changer in, in the space, right? Yeah. Um, we are in we are in interesting times. So, mm. but as you say, this is one of many problems that hospitals are facing around cybersecurity. Right? right, we have designed our hospitals 
for the facilitation of clinical services. The result is we have large flat networks that allow anyone who has an Active Directory, or well, today Active Directory, ID to access any system uh, on the network, okay. right, with a separate login to Cerner or Epic or, or Scripps or whatever systems they're, they're logging into. Um, and we don't really have you know, a layered defense in healthcare that we do in other industries, like, health, like finance, for example, okay. right? Um, where you have more of a, or in the military, where you have mandatory access controls, right? Yeah. You, based upon your rank, based upon your role, you have access to these five things and these five things only, right? We yeah. don't have that integrated role-based access um, within uh, our healthcare networks. We don't have zero trust right now yeah. at a user level or an object level, uh, plainly at an object level, given the number of medical yeah. devices, um, and we need to get there, right? And micro segmentation at the object level allows us to get to more of that zero trust basis yeah. around management of discrete you know, dumb objects, yeah. medical devices, yeah. for example. Um, and obviously on the human side, we have some processes to work through there yeah. to tell doctors, no, you know, you work in oncology, you're, you're not allowed in maternity systems, right? Um, you work in this particular area of the hospital, you shouldn't be allowed in, in that particular area. And right. doctors are rather conservative. Uh, if there's any doctors in the audience, I come from a family of doctors, trust me, I know about it firsthand. <laughs> but um, it, 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 it's not something that's gonna happen overnight. Well, no, I, I, I think it's interesting that healthcare is one of the biggest drivers of digital innovation, I feel. Like, what we're doing is incredible in a lot of different ways. But there's, there's a lot of churn going on in the industry yeah. right now around digital interoperability, the mm. integration of IoT, mm. the integration of AI and ML. I mean, there's some great presentations um, here at Vive uh, over the past few days talking about how we apply AI to, to healthcare, yeah. right? And AI is plainly going to be the future, right? Because right. we don't have enough people to manage the needs of society as society continues to age and as we, you know, we demand better healthcare services but to do so at a cost that we can afford, which is the age old problem in the United States. You know, a great country with, a, with great GDP and we spend 20% of it on keeping ourselves alive you know, from our healthcare system. $4.1 trillion, mm. is a crazy amount of money. Anyway. But, but don't you think it's interesting that we are building these incredible systems, but we still have, I wouldn't say medical device security is like rotten, but it, it does seem like a weakened foundation. And if we're gonna keep building on top, right. We, should we, be doing... we haven't gone back and secured the foundation. Right. right? We're, we're layering more and more technologies and more and more capabilities to improve patient outcomes yeah. um, into our health systems without going back and fixing some of the fundamental problems. It's right. kind of like you know, trying to master algebra and you haven't managed to master arithmetic yet, right? right. Um, it's, it's a block-based system that you, know, you need to build that foundation, establish those baselines. Yeah, I, I, and we talk about this a lot where there's every vendor has some kind of solution for things from analyzing device behavior to micro segmentation, which you've mentioned, which is obviously a necessary step. But um, uh, let's make this simple for the CISOs and the CIOs. You know, what's the feasibility of some of these uh, solutions? And in reality, how can providers begin to chip away at these IoT problems and sort of strengthen the foundation? I, I think the key comes down to automation, right? So uh, if I put my, you know, my former scissor hat on and I've got suddenly all these devices that I need to go off, well, not suddenly because I knew about them, but um, I have a whole heap of devices that I need to go after. I have limited resources. I have limited staff. I have limited, uh, limited money to spend on tools. Um, I have limited time to deal with a multitude of different things that are coming my way, particularly in the current climate, as we've heard from other speakers today. But... Um, I want to be able to um, want to be able to address these problems, and I think automation is really the key. You need tools that are going to do this for you. You need tools that are AI based, that are smart, that can go out, understand what's on the network, that can build profiles of devices, um, can look for anomalous behaviour. Uh, of those devices once the profile is established. That profile can be used for auto micro segmentation. So you just throw a switch. You don't need to you know, spend hours and hours or days or weeks or months building up uh, profiles for devices. It's dynamic, so it's continuously updated. Um, and you need to be able to port 
information that that system provides to all of your existing systems. You don't want to be reinventing the wheel here. But you, most importantly, you want to be able to take anomalous behavior and you want to feed that into your SIM tools, right? So that your SOC is aware, um, or if you don't have a SOC, your NOC, or whoever manages uh, your eyes on glass security operations, so that they're aware that, hey, there's a device here that normally just talks to these three servers and it's chirping out to Ukraine right now, right? Um, or there's a connection coming in um, over a management port uh, that appears to be coming from Russia, right? Or there's malform requests going to this device. Uh, and therefore, it's a potential indicator of compromise that needs to be remediated. And then we want automated processes around the remediation of systems. So based upon our runbook, we want to, we want to understand what a device does, right? If that device is behaving anomalously, is it something I can kick off the network without impacting patient care, without, Im imp implement, uh, without causing a patient safety issue? Or is it something that I need to call out someone like a BMET to come along and replace a particular device? And we're not at that, that level yet. So it's a combination of people, process, and technology, just like all security solutions are. I feel like most people that have heard me uh, uh, interview people know that I don't typically do tools, but what I have heard from pretty much everyone is that we're attempting to do a manual process for tens of thousands of devices, and it's just an impossible yeah, task. Yeah, exactly. Automation seems like the only way that would be effective. Would that uh, effectively you know, deal with the inventory and visibility challenges, or is that like a whole different... Yeah, I, I, think, it, yeah. I, I think it would. Yeah. I mean, there are certainly tools out there. I mean, we heard from some of our previous presentations yeah. um, around you know, the, the need for trust um, of, of those tools, and I think that's where we need to get to. Yeah. Instead of trying to, to sell you know, discrete pieces of code or discrete applications, we need to get to the point that we're partnered with um, the providers and vendors in this particular space to solve a complex cybersecurity risk management problem. We t I've been talking a lot about threat sharing all, uh, this week. I just I think it's an important uh, discussion to be having because I feel like we're not doing enough of that sort of discrete, like, okay, I'm having this problem. How does that apply to medical device security? I don't think that you and I talk about that very often, but right. how can we better inform each other? Um, uh, there are ad hoc networks uh, between CISOs uh, right the way across the country. And if there's any CISOs in the audience, uh, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, of course, HISAC, we had Errol here earlier talking about the uh, healthcare information sharing um, that goes on within, within ISACs. And they're, they're very powerful at, at, uh, uh, at uh, sharing information, of, particularly around things like threat vectors that are being used. Um, there's a lot of research in the medical device space. Uh, Mayo Clinic um, has done a, a heap of work uh, around defining medical devices, profiling medical devices, mm -hmm. understanding it um, under um, Kevin McDonald and uh, Deborah Brumer. Um, Kevin's moved on now, obviously, but um, they did a lot of the baselining of these systems and have now passed it on to you know, operational folks that can then look at that information. And I think finally through the vendors, right? Yeah. Um, you know, those of us that operate in this space have a massive amount of, of data, yeah. right? Um, and we're sharing that back to, to the hospitals to say, look, this is what we're seeing, right? Yeah. This is what you need to be concerned about. Because in a sea of white noise, right. you need to know what's important, what's critical, what's urgent, what needs to be dealt with today versus what you can deal with on Monday, right? And that ties into my uh, next point of discussion, which is, you know, there's an understanding that healthcare is always going to have to deal with a certain amount of risk. Um, but I've always found it interesting, I guess, um, trying to assess, you know, how we determine what is considered accessible risk. Um, and so how can providers figure out what that means for their entity, you know, and their organization and patient safety at the same time? I think, I think a framework, a cybersecurity framework, like right. the, the NIST CSF, which is obviously widely adopted across U.S. healthcare at this point, um, it is critical, right? Um, you need a holistic approach to understand what your risks are, and you need to be able to you know, build that framework into your cybersecurity management plan and then obviously report that through to senior executives um, in the hospital so that you can get funding, budget, what have you, for tools, technology, people. Um, in order to to uh, secure your uh, to secure your environment, but at the end of the day, uh, when we're talking about healthcare, when we're talking about medical device security, it comes down to patient safety, right? Um, this this is really the critical factor. 
Are patients likely to suffer? Is there likely to be an impact to patient morbidity or patient mortality as a result of some of the cyber attacks we're seeing? And if we look back at, you know, WannaCry, for example, mm -hmm. right, um, 2017, I think it was, uh, where a number of hospital systems not too many in, in, the, in the US, but the UK obviously was massively impacted by WannaCry. A third of hospitals' uh, systems went down as a result of you know, a ransomware attack that essentially encrypted um, the hard drives of a whole heap of devices, medical devices, pack stations, um, RIS stations, uh, workstations throughout the entire environment. That caused an availability problem from a cybersecurity perspective, and as a result of the lack of availability of HIT and HIOT systems, uh, patients were uh, unable to receive services uh, in a timely manner. Some critical patients had to be diverted in ambulances to other hospitals, uh, while other patients that maybe were, you know, uh, had appointments for chemotherapy or radiotherapy or something else that would prolong their lives, um, had to uh, had to reschedule sometimes many months out right so what was the impact on their lives did they die early as a result of the unavailability of systems um, did people die in, in ambulances right um, as one German woman did when there was a uh, uh, at the University of Dusseldorf hospital uh, last year when uh, that hospital was subjected to a ransomware attack right these are the types of threats that we need to understand and, and we need to take account of, right? Yeah, and it seems like you're saying that it, we can determine what risk is susceptible, whether or not that device is directly in contact with a patient. So I, th I think, you know, from a cybersecurity perspective, we're, we're really concerned about protecting the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of health information, right? That's what HIPAA tells us is important, and I think that's the way that we all operate in this space. I think confidentiality is already lost, right? Uh, I know my identity um, is out there on the dark web, right? I know whoever mines the dark web, probably the Russians and the Chinese between them, uh, they have everything that they need to, to know to assume my identity and run amok, right? Uh, and I assume that is the case for the vast majority of Americans because, you know, we have all, our lives are, are highly digital, right? Um, and it's not just a question of whether you're on Facebook or Instagram. It's, it's everything in your life right the way down, you know, to uh, your mortgage company, to the taxes that you pay, to everything else that's in public records. Um, confidentiality, I think, is already lost. And we spend a lot of time and effort uh, around breach reporting and you know, HIPAA compliance and all the rest of it. And I think that's one example of why HIPAA is somewhat out of date today. It's important, don't get me wrong, but there are things that are more important, like the integrity of medical information. Now, if I am going in for surgery tomorrow and someone uh, breaks into my medical record and changes my blood type, uh, or removes my allergies, uh, then I could be in a critical clinical or medical um, situ placed into a critical medical situation, right? Uh, if, my, if I'm morbidly allergic to um, a, uh, a particular drug and that drug is given to me, then obviously I'm going to have a, a reaction to that that could potentially kill me. If the wrong blood is given to me, I'm going to have a transfusion reaction that may manifest itself as, as an infection. Um, and, you know, penicillin is given to me if I'm allergic to penicillin. You know, you've compounded the problem of, you know, the wrong blood being transfused and the wrong treatment being given to the patient. And therefore you end up in a in, in a very dire clinical situation. And at the same time, we've already talked about availability, what happens when those systems aren't there to treat us, right? What happens when uh, the da Vinci surgical robot that's performing the neurosurgery uh, on me on the operating table, uh, table um, is impacted by a delayed um, uh, malware uh, that takes over the device and suddenly stops working, right? What happens when another device that's critical um, to, uh, you know, to my well-being on the table is impacted at precisely the wrong time and, uh, you know, uh, I, uh, it puts me into a medical condition. So I think it's that clinical risk, uh, you know, that Dr. Saif Abed uh, and others yeah. have, have, you know, professed about that is, is of concern certainly to medical doctors. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's one of many, many risks that we need to be considering in healthcare.
Well, it's interesting because I think the devil's advocate of that for those that might think that's like a, you know, a far off use case. Uh, you know, I think about Zoom bombing, for example. Why would anyone do that, right? Why would anyone hack a device to do this, right? But it obviously happens and it's... We're in Miami Beach in spring break. There's a lot of stupid things happening at the moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, that reminds me, though, of the integrity and sort of the ease in which it is to do it. So uh, we talked a bit, too. Uh, I think that PAX uh, systems are often... They're part of the medical device situation, but I think they have their own sort of subcategory, but the ease in which to get into them is just as easy as it is for some of these other things. Yeah, yeah. And, and the thing is that a PAC system or a RIS system, they're paired with, you know, the, um, the contrast scanner or the x-ray machine, mm -hmm. right? Um, they are defined as a medical device, even though they're just a simple, most cases, a Windows workstation, right? Yeah. Now, we have to look at the processes that radiologists use in order to look at images, right? And if any of you work in the space, you'll, you'll know that uh, there are large PAX viewing stations, normally in dark rooms, with giant screens, um, and images are displayed in high definition on these giant screens, and uh, the radiologists look through them to look for abnormalities, for growths, you know, indicators of, uh, of cancer and all the rest of it. And some of that's now being AI enhanced, which highlights things that they need to look at. So if it's Friday afternoon, they're not gonna miss it, perhaps. Oh, hopefully not anyway. Um, so, but one of, the, one of the ways that they get through looking at thousands and thousands of images is with their music, right? So a lot of these PAX operators have their Spotify or their iTunes, you know, running on this medical device, this workstation, because they can, and they're listening to music in their darkened out rooms, looking at images, and it's a pretty boring job, quite frankly, but I'm not a radiologist, so uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure that, uh, you know, I'm sure that they, they like the music to, to pass the time, right, to help them to focus. Yeah. But that sort of ties back into sort of the what we were talking about earlier, which is the having the culture and the, you know, the understanding that that kind of behavior is not acceptable or safe and why it is, right? So Yeah, it's about changing human behavior. It's yeah. about putting in place appropriate policies and processes um, in order to manage down security. And it's a combination of, of many different layers here. Right, well, if you think about, like, <laughs> that essentially these devices are vulnerable and they're hackable, but I mean, you're not doing yourself a disservice if you're also allowing your employees to, you know, leave right. the door wide open. Right. Um, I, I think that you and I have definitely discussed the complexities of this, but and there's obviously no one solid solution, but there has to be sort of progress made. Um, you know, in an ideal world, you know, how would we effectively move past the awareness stage, because I think that we do understand it, to actionable differences. I, I think what we need to do is obviously prioritize um, cybersecurity in our healthcare systems. Yeah. Um, and I think regulation may help to drive that. There are others, I'm sure, in the audience who will probably say, no, no, regulation never works. But I think it, it gives people the kick in the backside to say, hang on, this is something that we absolutely have yeah. to do. The, the big issue with healthcare is every dollar you spend on security is, is a dollar that's not being spent on patient care. Um, now, the question is, are we doing patients a disservice by maybe denying or delaying a service to them because of lack of funds? Um, or are we doing them a disservice by killing them on the operating table or subjecting them to undue patient safety risks as a result of inadequate cybersecurity controls? And that's, that's an equation, a balance that I think the profession needs to you know, get a better grip with. It's true, but... It, it, it often seems, and I'm obviously on the outside a bit, but it seems like maybe we're not always investing our money wisely in the security budgets that we do have. Well, one could talk about the arguments of the efficiency across the healthcare <laughs> sy system you know, generally, right? You know, yeah. we spend so much money, and yet, you know, 40% of the population don't have access to, to health services, right? Yeah. Um, we have developed a, a, a a baroque system of healthcare in this country that really started after the when the GIs came home from the Second World War, and we've never really sat down structurally and designed it for the 21st century. Um, you know, we spend far too much money on healthcare here, uh, and we have the most expensive healthcare in the world, and some of the worst patient outcomes. Right. True, but tying it back into just the cybersecurity specific uh, budget portion, are there ways that we can sort of maybe consolidate vendors or you know assess whether or not we need X, Y, or Z to sort of make a dent in this? Because it seems like we're just throwing money at a problem, but we're not using 
the money wisely to actually make We a certainly need yeah. to get a lot smarter around some of the purchasing syst uh, purchasing decisions yeah. and some of the prioritization. Yeah, yeah. totally agree with you. How do you see that happening? Because it's interesting because we've been talking about this, uh, you know, for at least six years now. And while I, I have been very heartened by the fact that this is, it's common, it's becoming more common knowledge. Um, I feel like we're still struggling on that uh, process uh, or the, the progress. Um, do you, maybe I'm a little bit uh, pessimistic. What are you hearing on your end and do you think that perhaps there are ways that we can sort of better educate to sort of do something, you know? Uh, at the end of the day, security is everyone's responsibility in the hospital, right? Yeah. Um, uh, Chad Wilson, when he was at uh, he was CISO at, um, at Children's National, uh, did a survey of click rates uh, right the way across the hospital. And he coordinated that with his security education training and awareness programs that were ongoing and could demonstrate to the board the return on investment mm. of the, the SATA program that he had running there. Because when it was running, everyone was cognizant, everyone was aware, uh, people didn't click on uh, attachments, they didn't open up emails from, uh, from unknown senders. Uh, that they weren't expecting. They didn't uh, go to URLs that they weren't, weren't sure of, right? Uh, their threat, the, the threats that the, the hospital were exposed to were considerably reduced. Um, I mean, Chad and his survey did a, did a great job at actually demonstrating to executive leadership that there is a direct correlation here between risk and investment, right? Yeah. Uh, and perhaps that's something that we in the cybersecurity space need to, to do a little bit better at, right? It's yeah. showing value for money to uh, those that in the ultimate decision-making um, positions uh, around where they spend their money, where they place their emphasis. Yeah. Well, to that point, it seems like they're, we finally understand that you know ransomware has a price tag, right? So we have that data for bigger attacks, but I feel like there may be fewer data points on how to sort of translate that ROI or risk to the board, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it comes down to you know a holistic approach to security, as I said earlier, using you know using a, a cybersecurity framework like this CSF to make sure that you're not spending all of your money on the world's most impregnable front door yeah. uh, and that you have got money left over to put, you know, window locks, you know, on the building and to make sure that the rattly lock on the back door is replaced, yeah. right? Um, for many years, I mean, I've been in the healthcare space for 25, 30 years now, and I've seen some major uh, outlays of cash that hospitals have spent on port barrel projects, essentially, yeah. right? Uh, yes, they're great, they're really high profile, um, everyone's highly s supportive of it, um, but it's distracting the organization from you know, clinical or cyber risks that they need to be concerned about. So it's understanding that balance and looking at a holistic approach. What would you say to someone that just sort of looks at the mountain of medical device security and sort of says, nah, like, because that has the, to happen. The first thing you've got to do is to understand your assets. You have to understand what medical devices or what devices are connecting to your network, right? And it's not just medical devices, it's, you know, it's um, uh, consultant devices, it's guest wife wireless, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I was in a hospital about three years ago uh, that was suffering a network outage, and it was actually caused by, it was a pediatric hospital, uh, not Chad's, a different one, but um, it was a pediatric hospital, and a dad had come in with his, uh, his tablet, his Android tablet, um, to see his daughter in there and was busy doing email or playing games on the tablet, and this tablet was utterly infested with some malware, and it was essentially taking out the wireless access point for that part of the hospital, uh, because it was, it was doing broadcast storming and all kinds of nasty stuff. Um, and it took a while to figure out what was causing the problem so that medical devices, legitimate medical devices, could communicate against. Um, so that obviously introduces a risk to, you know, to patients, it introduces a risk to uh, the availability of HIT and HIOT systems um, through a shared resource like a simple wireless access, even though it was using a different SSID. It feels like you have basically described the need, again, to sort of look at the small things that we can do first, because it, that seems like that should never have happened. Yeah, yeah. It comes down to a structured approach, right? Okay. 
So you need to look at all available risk. You need to be able to quantify those risks. Um, and at this point, we need to automate the remediation of some of those risks, yeah. right? Yeah. We've got AI out there. We've got ML out there. We can use these tools for the next generation of security and, and medical applications to make our lives easier, right? Are we doing better? I, I often I, I think we are. It's a slow journey. We're not there yet by a long shot. Oh, yeah. Uh, and there are a lot of setbacks, but we're fighting, we're trying to progress and go back and fix a lot of these problems at the same time that we're layering on new technologies and, yeah. you know, the, there are new requirements around interoperability, um, around, you know, the meaningful exchange of, of information, and these are continually moving barriers here, um, and it's a question of maintaining focus on some of the small things, right? Yeah. Well, uh, I think with that, we can uh, close. I think that was really good. Thank you guys for sticking with us. Thank uh, you all. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you, Jessica. All right, thank you.